welcome everybody to today's uh, IHR session uh, at the History of Education seminar. I'm Gary McCulloch and I'm chairing today's session and uh, I'm delighted to say we, we've had very wide interest from colleagues and friends around the world who will be taking part today. Um, and uh, our guest speaker today is Professor uh, Lindsay Patterson uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Lindsay is one of the foremost uh, historians of education and policy analysts in education uh, in the UK and I'm really delighted that she's able to join us today uh, online and he'll be followed uh, with uh, the short discussions by Anya Gudici uh, from the University of Oxford and Rita Nikolai uh, from the University of Augsburg. So without further ado I'm delighted to, to pass over to uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Anderson, Lindsay, Lindsay Patterson. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for the invitation to join in this. I, I have to confess, this is my first experience of doing a seminar online, so I hope the technology, um, I hope I'm not too clumsy with the technology, but I will proceed. Um, so my main purpose today is to investigate how educational institutions interacted with socioeconomic and sex differences in secondary education in the second half of the 20th century. And in particular, to look how, at how institutional history might have conditioned that interaction. And this work uh, has been funded by the Leverage Trust, to whom I'm very grateful. Now, I'm going to be doing that for Scotland because Scotland used to have probably the best long term series of statistical data on these questions of any country in the world. I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. The data relate to what is now the past. That data series came to an end about a decade and a half ago. A subsidiary purpose is to ask not only what role did deliberate policy and institutional legacies play in bringing about changes in socioeconomic and sex differences, but also to ask how long does it take for any such effects to be clear. There's also perhaps a methodological point. I'm a sociologist, not a historian, so Gary's very kind introduction, and my main method of research is analysing social surveys. But in many countries now, social surveys have, have been running for long enough to provide not only current evidence, but also historical evidence. So the methodological point that I would suggest today is that bringing together historical survey evidence with a normal ethnographic and archival evidence of historians can be very fruitful, I think, for understanding the recent past, but that's something we might debate. So throughout the 20th century, the main mechanism by which policymakers have tried to reform education has been by reforming institutions. But several writers have pointed out that policy is constrained by the historical legacies of these institutions. Mayor and Rowan, for example, in 1977, noted that schools can modify policy through their histories, rituals and myths. What um, Ocasio, and I'm trying to get the slides to move on. There we are. Uh, what Ocasio et al, writing more generally about persisting institutions, call their historically situated webs of meaning and significance. Rita Nicolai suggests that institutional effects arise because accumulated commitments and investments in the selected path make it difficult to effect any profound change. For example, there can be a school's legacy of particular buildings so that the prior investment in a library or in a well-equipped scientific laboratory can encourage studies of a particular kind. The legacy can be what Nikolai also calls administrative routines, such as the relative attention which a school gives to students' progression to university or to direct entry into the labour market. Some previous research has investigated such questions empirically over short periods or in relation to specific sectors. The classic study is by Frick Ringer, as long ago as 1979 now, showing the persistence of school traditions through the modernization that took place in France and Germany and to some extent England as secondary education was being established in the early 20th century. Hilary Steedman noted the power of the English public schools in setting the model for the grammar schools of the middle of the 20th century. Andrew McPherson and Doug Wilms investigated the persistence of inequalities in Scotland related to school origin. And Kirchhoff et al. found similarly in England and Wales that the history of schools before the ending of selection in the 1960s affected how the schools responded to that reform. Generally, though, the studies of changing inequality in the second half of the 20th century have not had detailed information on the school that sample members have attended. 
Thus, any inferences that were drawn about the likely effects of policy have been based mainly on comparisons of nationwide inequality before and after a reform. There's analogous research on how the institutional character of schools might be said to be homologous to particular kinds of university. The most common finding on how the character of a school might affect the probability of entering higher education has related to the difference between independent schools, which charge fees, and public sector schools. Some of the research has also distinguished among different categories of higher education institutions. And the conclusion of all this body of work is that, on the whole, high status schools tend to be associated with high status universities or courses. Vicky Bolivar, for example, with data from England, found that independent schools increased their students' chances of applying to and being accepted by high status universities over and above their school attainment. Chris Taylor and colleagues from Cardiff found that school effects in Wales were particularly strong for entering elite universities. These examples tend to be about how school traditions constrain change. However, traditions can also help to bring about change. Institutional practices and teacher careers interact with what Clementi et al. call critical events or turning points. Change might be particularly likely if the traditions embody contradictory tendencies, as Alistair McIntyre notes. Traditions, he said, when vital, embody continuities of conflict. In Scotland, the long standing belief in competitive meritocracy, ultimately due to the educational structures that were put in place by the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, left a legacy that could be shaped towards wider democratic reform by astute policymakers. The 1960s reformers that um, created comprehensive education understood that point and shaped the highly competitive and meritocratic character of the first phases of Scottish comprehensive education to take advantage of that history. The main body of theory which has been offered to explain school effects on entry to higher education relates to what has been called institutional habitus. Donnelly defines this succinctly as a set of dispositions and behaviours that are, that are the product of a school's past experiences, staff and pupils. That makes clear the metaphorical analogy to what Nash calls the stable dispositions of individual habitus as originally defined by Bourget. This theory attaches particular significance to institutional history. As Diane Ray and her colleagues point out that institutional habituses, no less than individual habituses, have a history and have been established over time. In some respects, I think this idea of institutional habitus is simply a way of representing what Margaret Atcher called the relationship between structure and agency. So the purpose of the empirical analysis, which I'll now report, is to look at the legacies and effects of particular types of historically defined schools, universities and colleges. Scotland is a useful case study for two reasons. One is the unique historical extent of available data, allowing the role, allowing the role of categories of schools and higher education institutions to be examined over a long period of time. The other reason is that Scotland is quite typical, having followed common international trends since the middle of the 20th century. So I'll outline these policy developments in Scotland before moving on to the main analysis. In relation to secondary schools, the best known reform was the ending of selection between different kinds of schools in the public sector, the second period on this slide. Comprehensive, that is non-selective secondary schooling, was introduced from 1965 and achieved universal coverage in the public sector schools by the beginning of the 1980s. Thereafter, the only selective schools in Scotland were independent of public management and charged fees. After the minimum leaving age was raised from 15 to 16 in 1973, there also had to be a revision of the curriculum of the middle years of secondary school. The resulting reforms led to properly planned courses for almost the full range of ability in the 1980s. That reform then subsequently enabled a new curriculum framework to be put in place in the 1990s, making more or less compulsory the core subjects at mid-secondary level. Now, these reforms after the 1960s are the best known features of school reform, but they were not the beginning. Some kind of secondary education for all was established between the early 20th century and the mid 1930s, the first period on this slide, leading to the selective system that in turn was replaced by the comprehensive system. So I'll be looking also at any possible long term effects of these older institutional changes, as well as at the effects of institutional transitions during the comprehensive era. This secondary education for all reform was established in several waves, leading to five recognisable subsets of schools in the selective system, each with potentially distinctive legacies. 
these five subsets are shown on this slide with their relative sizes in the late 1940s. At the foot of the slide are schools which were founded before the 20th century, highlighted in red here. There were about 50 of these schools editing, educating about one in eight students. The main policy change that would culminate in the selective secondary system was in the first decade of the 20th century. The core element of that change was that central government encouraged and funded the creation of about 200 new secondary schools to serve districts populated mainly by the lower middle class and the skilled working class. That expansion came to an end in the 1920s when about two thirds of these new schools were recognized as full secondaries. These are the schools highlighted in red here. Some new secondaries continued to be built giving three distinct subsets of what were called senior secondaries analogous to the grammar schools in England, the highest status parts of the selective system, which the comprehensive schools eventually replaced. The lowest status parts of the selective system were called junior secondaries, of which there were two kinds highlighted here. So they're like the secondary moderns in England and Wales. The larger group consisted of essentially primary schools with a short secondary department added on top. These were the lowest status parts of the selective system. But some of the junior secondaries developed from the one third of pre-1924 schools, which were not recognized as full secondaries in 1924. But because they retained something of the academic ethos of their origins, many of them, many of these schools insisted on teaching academic courses to small groups of students, despite official discouragements. So I called these junior secondaries academic junior secondaries. That was a term, incidentally, that was sometimes used in the 1950s. Almost all of these schools survived in some form into the 1980s and beyond. And so I'll be using this topology on this slide to investigate whether there are any, any long-term legacies of these early 20th century reforms. I'll also be looking at whether these early reforms left a legacy that interacted with the later reforms of the 1960s, because the schools of different origin ended selection at different times, as we can see here. The column on this slide correspond to the date at which a school became non-selective, became comprehensive. And the rows are the historical sectors that I've just mentioned. For example, a larger minority, 17% of the oldest schools reformed most slowly. That's the bottom of this slide. In contrast, the secondaries founded in the three or four decades before the 1960s had the highest proportion, 77%, that reformed most quickly before 1972. The quality of students learning throughout the 20th century was assessed by examinations administered by state agencies, as in many countries. Scotland adopted this way of assessing credentials early from 1888. And the core part of that remains to this day, the examinations officially called higher grade and colloquially known as the hires. These are usually taken in the first in the final two years of secondary school. At levels immediately below that in education and in intellectual and educational demand have been a variety of assessments which were called lower grade uh, up to 1961, ordinary grade from there to the late 1980s, and standard grade from then until the end of the century. Also, as in many other countries, Scotland reformed its system of higher education in two waves, in the 1960s and in the 1990s. The story here is more familiar, and so I'll summarise it quite briefly. There are four historically defined sectors of higher education, the size of which among school leaver entrants after the 1960s is shown on this slide. Three, or three of the four old universities were founded in the 15th century as part of the second wave of medieval European university creation. The fourth of these old universities, Edinburgh, was founded in the late 16th century in the aftermath of the Reformation. Secondly, the four universities created in the 1960s came as a result of the Robbins reforms. Only one of them was wholly new. Two of them had independent institutional predecessors, and so the label will be used here slightly anachronistically to refer to these predecessors in the early 1960s. Then third, the universities created in the 1990s all had institutional predecessors, some dating back as colleges to the late 19th century. Again, the 1990s label is used here for the whole data series. And then the final group, number four, consists of non-degree courses and professional courses, which are mainly now courses leading to a higher national certificate or diploma, usually one or two years in length. OK, so that's a, the background, and this is the research question. Did institutional history interact with policy change and social change in the second half of the 20th century? The series of surveys that I'm going to be using covers people who were aged 16 in 1952 and then mostly every two years from the early 1960s 
to the end of the century. And here's a very quick summary of what these surveys are. I'm very grateful for access to data from the 1952 survey to Professor Ian Deary and his colleagues at the Centre for Cognitive Ageing at Edinburgh University. The Scottish Cool Leavers Survey, which later was called the Scottish Young People Survey, ran from 1976 to the end of the century, being a survey of leavers to 1982 and a cohort survey of 16 year olds from 1984. There were three predecessor surveys of leavers in 1962, 70 and 72, which surveyed only people with at least one pass in the higher grade exam. That's these three surveys in the 60s and 70s can be used only to study transition to higher education, not the full range of attainment. And I'm very grateful for access to all these leavers and cohort surveys to Linda Crotsford and Cathy Howsam of the Centre for Educational Sociology at Edinburgh University. For some purposes briefly, I'll also use the Scottish subset sample of the UK-wide National Study of Health and Development, which is a cohort study of people born in 1946. Now all these surveys, as with any secondary data analysis of surveys conducted long ago, varied somewhat in their design, but they were all random, and apart from the 1952 survey, were all based on postal questionnaires, although latterly some of the attainment data was linked in directly from examination bodies. I'll mainly refer to these surveys by the date when their members turned 16. The total sample size of all these surveys taken together is about 100,000 students spread over this half century in, on average each year, about 420 schools. Social class is measured by the Registrar General scheme, which is the only measure available for the whole survey series. I classified schools into the historical categories that I explained on an earlier slide and previous archival work using the National Archives of Scotland, which have an immense amount of rich data on when schools made the transition into different types of institutional status on the kinds of syllabus and curricula that they had at any particular moment in time. Information on when each school made the transition to comprehensive education was kindly supplied by Andrew McPherson and Dunn Wilms. So now some data. By way of introduction to the analysis, the first few slides illustrate sheer expansion. This one shows the growth of certification at mid-secondary level, the proportion passing at least one subject there. Around one in 10 in 1952, one quarter in 1962, one half in the mid 1970s, three quarters by the late 1980s and 90% at the end of the century. There is a similar trajectory for other school outcomes. The blue line added here is voluntarily staying on beyond age 16. Still under one third in the late 1970s, one half by the late 1980s and 70% by the end of the century. Then the pink line is passes at the higher grade, which I've called here a senior secondary pass. That reached one half by the century's end. And the green line shows three or more passes at higher. And for most of this period, this was informally the threshold for entry directly to university from school. It was no more than one in 20 in the early 1950s, one in 10 in the 1960s, one in six in the 1970s, one in five in the 1980s, and then one third in the 1990s. Still on this introductory setting of the context for looking at institutions, socioeconomic inequality of attainment gradually reduced after the 1970s as the next few slides show. This graph shows passing at mid-secondary level classified by socioeconomic status and sex. That is high, medium and low socioeconomic status or SES as I'll refer to it for males and females. Uh, the, the three SES groups are classes one, three and five in the scheme each at the modal level of parental education within the year. All the lines rise. The hierarchy remains quite stable, but the gap reduces, especially for females um, at the end of the series, towards the end of the century. So this evidence at mid-secondary seems to be a prime instance of what has been called maximally maintained inequality by Raftery and Hout. First, a rise to saturation in the most advantaged groups, nearly 100% in the blue lines for both males and females, and then a fairly steady catching up by other groups. What's more, a similar trajectory can be seen for staying on voluntarily beyond age 16. The rise in staying on then eventually fed into a rise in successful attainment in the school stages beyond that. This shows passing at least one higher grade Socioeconomic differences remain wider there than on the previous criteria, but they were reduced, especially for female students. So for low SES males, low socioeconomic status males, the percentage rose from 3% to 24% over this period, but for females it rose from 3% to around 30%, a greater rise. Indeed, the female trajectory overtook the male trajectory at each level of SES. 
Yes, so this graph is actually the same as the previous graph, but now reorganized to express it as direct comparison between male and female. Females overtook males at high SES in the 1960s, uh, and at medium SES in the 1970s, and at low SES in the 1990s. There was also a broadening of the curriculum at mid-secondary level. I'm defining breadth here to be at least one pass in English, in mathematics, in a natural science, and in either a social subject or a language or an aesthetic subject. This graph shows that in all three of these social groups for both males and females, there was a rise in the proportion attaining breadth defined in that way, but there was also an increase of inequality in attaining breadth. The, the gap between the different groups is greater at the end than at the beginning of the series, whether you express that in absolute terms or relatively as a proportion. So that's all the context of what I mainly want to say. And the main point is then now, what is the role, what was the role of institutions in all these changes that I've summarized very briefly in these graphs? So let's start by considering the ending of selection for secondary school. For this next section, I'll be looking only at public sector schools, at schools managed by public authorities, omitting the independent schools that never stopped um, selecting, but I'll come back to the independent schools shortly. Recall that all public sector schools in Scotland became comprehensive or non-selective by the early 1980s and that they educated about 95% of students throughout this whole period. I'll focus on the period when the comprehensive change was happening recorded in the surveys of leavers between 1976 and 1984. One strength of this data series is that it allows us to compare schools that became comprehensive at different points during this period. In particular, we can compare schools that changed their status in the mid 1970s with the control group, which did not become comprehensive until the late 1970s. So that's what's shown here. This first slide shows the proportion passing at least one mid-secondary subject in the schools that became comprehensive in the mid 1970s. That's the leavers in 1976 here at the left hand end of the graph experienced these schools when they were selective, whereas the leavers in 1980 at the right hand end of the graph experienced them when they were comprehensive. The percentages displayed to the left and the right of the graphs show the gap between high status and low status students in 1976 and 1980. The rise of the magenta and blue lines shows a reduction of these SES differences. The next graph focuses on these differences. All that the next graph does is take these percentages and makes them into bars on the next graph, which is there. Because the change from left to right here is the change from being selective to not being selective, some part of that reduction might plausibly be said to be due to the ending of selection, that is to the specific role of institutions in this decade. That impression would be reinforced by comparing these institutions, the reduction of inequality in these institutions, with the analogous change in the control group of schools which remained selective between these two points in time. The green bars here are the schools which became comprehensive in this period, as on the previous two slides. The orange bars are the schools which remained selective up to the late 1970s. And so they were selective in both of these say, surveys. Although we can now see that there was also a reduction of inequality from left to right in the orange bars for male students, that reduction was less than the reduction for the green bars, that's for the schools that became comprehensive, and there was even an increase in the orange bars for female students. Again then, some part of the reduction of inequality in the green bars might be attributable to the change of status from selective to non-selective. We reach a similar conclusion if we then look at what happened to the orange bars when these schools in turn became comprehensive in time for people aged 16 in 1984. We can compare them now with the group of early reformers that were comprehensive throughout the whole period because they became comprehensive before even the 1976 survey. Over the whole period, the orange bars do show a fall of inequality. So becoming comprehensive after 1980, compensated for any stagnation, or increase of inequality before that, as we saw in the previous slide. Over the whole period, the blue bars show a greater fall than the orange bars, which is consistent with what might be called a maturing effect of the early comprehensives. So there may indeed be some evidence of an institutional effect on ending selection, the particular pace at which schools changed. It's just although announced as a national policy by central government, this is not really best interpreted as a national policy at all, but rather as a policy that had an impact on different schools, different institutions at different times during the reforming period. So that's our first conclusion about the historical trajectories of institutions. 
the rate of adopting a reform can make an enormous difference to how students experience that reform. But that analysis of the comprehensive reforms isn't enough because there is also a legacy during this period from the older reforms earlier in the 20th century. The first feature to note is that the legacy of that much earlier reform was still evident as late as the late 1970s, at least in their social composition. This graph shows the social class composition of the six sectors at three dates um, in this period, 1952, 1978 and 1998. Highlighted at the right here on this slide is the national proportions in the different social classes as a kind of yardstick to compare the sectors. Note the growth date of the share in the high social class groups, that's the dark blue and the light group, blue, and growth over time and the share of the total population in higher status groups. The independent schools highlighted here had very untypically large percentages in these high social class groups. These are the blue bars again in the, the blue parts and these three bars at each of the three days. The oldest scar, uh, schools, which is the leftmost column highlighted here, also had higher social class than the others right up to the 1970s. That is the blue bars, the blue bits of these bars remain greater than the blue bits of the bars at the right hand end of the slide. It was still in the case in the 1970s that the new schools highlighted here had somewhat greater proportions of low social class students than the oldest schools. Remember that these schools were created deliberately to extend secondary education to skilled working class and lower middle class districts of the country. The schools that had been junior secondaries before the 1970s highlighted here also had some legacy of that in the late 1970s insofar as they had somewhat greater percentages in the low social class groups, that's the red and brown bits of these bars. But by the end of the century, all of these distinctions in the public sector schools had gone. Look at the bottom row of this graph. Each of the bars looks very similar to the bar at the right hand end, which is the bar summarizing the whole picture. The only exception being the independent schools which charge uh, fees. Now this homogenizing of the schools in the public sector can itself be regarded as some measure of policy success. Minimizing social divisions was the word used in the policy document that inaugurated the ending of selection. The question then is now whether the historically defined sectors had legacies in attainment. And the answer is that they did. This next graph shows the period from 1952 only as far as 1980 for public sector schools only. The red lines here, and it's, a, it's the proportion of people attaining one senior secondary pass or better, that's a high grade pass or better. The red lines are the oldest secondaries. The orange and pink lines are the schools founded as full secondaries before the 1950s. And so the red, orange and pink lines constitute the senior secondary, the selective part of the old pre-comprehensive system. The green and the blue lines are the low status junior secondaries. Although up to the 1980s, the lines for the different schools do converge. They are still somewhat separate, even in the late 1970s, especially at medium and low social class. At these two levels, that's the middle group and the right hand group on this uh, graph, the oldest sec secondaries, the red lines here, were mostly ahead in attainment of the newer schools created by the 1920s, which is the orange and pink lines even when all of these were full senior secondaries in 1952, and even after most of these schools were comprehensive in 1980. There was still that historical residue of the different historical origins of these three sectors. The two junior secondary sectors, that's the green and the blue bars uh, lines, were of course far behind in 1952 and took a while to catch up during their move to comprehensive schooling, but they did start to do so. But then there was full convergence by the end of the century, which this graph now shows. So this is the same as the previous graph, but now goes beyond the 1980s. And there was a steadily rising thing, but more importantly, more interestingly here, there is tight convergence of the five historically defined sectors in the public, uh, public part of schooling. At the end of the century, there was little remaining residue of the date of founding, and so that is evidence of policy having an effect of homogenizing across the whole country. If it hadn't been for the earlier reforms, the early 20th century reforms, the orange and pink groups on this graph wouldn't even have existed. And if, but if it hadn't been for the comprehensive reforms, the green and blue groups would not have caught up. But there's also an intriguing way in this graph in which the comprehensive reforms interacted 
with the long-term legacy of the liberal reforms from early in the century. This was illustrated by extracting two of the sectors. The oldest sec the secondaries in red here, these are the secondaries that predated the 20th century, and those junior secondaries which I have described as academic, which are shown in green here. Recall that these academic junior secondaries are schools which in one form or another persevered in providing some proper secondary education, even in the face of official discouragement before the comprehensive period. What we can see here is that these schools were particularly effective in the 1990s for people of medium social class. So the green line is above the red line in, the in most of the 1990s, not uh, until the very end of that period. The virtues of these former academic junior secondaries isn't limited to that. The next graph looks at breadth of attainment. This graph also now includes the independent schools, which are shown in a, as a broken red line. And then we've also still got the old uh, public sector schools, that's the red line, and the academic junior secondaries in the green line. In fact, um, for high social class students at the left hand end here, these former academic junior secondaries were almost as effective as the selective independent schools, especially for female students, as highlighted by these black circles here. Just consider that for a moment. By the end of the century, schools, which half a century earlier, were maintaining an academic tradition despite government discouragement, had by the end of the century as broad attainment for high status students as schools that charged thousands of pounds of fees than it selected their students by measured attainment at the end of primary school. So there were two kinds of legacy of institutional history during the period of comprehensive reform. One was the persistence of social class differences that lasted until the early 1980s, well after the initial reforming period of the 1960s. These class differences reflected policy from the 1920s and even earlier. The other legacy of institutional history was in the record of the 1990s of those comprehensive that had always tried to provide some academic study, often in defiance of official disapproval. What's more, in some respects, this older institutional legacy interacted with the institutional aspects of the 1960s reforms that I looked at um, somewhat earlier, as the next slide shows. This is for medium social class students, which as we saw, where the, 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 the place in the status distinction uh, distribution, where the strongest effects of the former academic junior secondaries was found. The graph shows the trajectory of schools which were early comprehensive, that they become comprehensive by the early 1970s, distinguishing within that category between schools that were old secondaries in red and the schools that had formerly been academic junior secondaries. The academic junior secondaries were behind until the late 1970s, but then these pioneering schools moved ahead. Thus, very old institutional history dating from the early years of the century not only led to average differences well into the comprehensive period, as we saw in a previous slide, but also interacted with the trajectory of institutional change during the reforming period. Now, that's about schools. The interaction of school history with, and educational institutions also then extends to what happens after students have left school. I'm now going to restrict attention to people with at least one higher grade pass that enables us to use the, the, the surveys in 1962, 70 and 72, but requires us to drop the 1952 survey because of small sample sizes. I'll first look at an institutional comparison that has been studied by other researchers in other countries. That is the difference between independent schools and education or public sector schools, but now distinguishing among types of university and looking at this over time. This distinction amongst university types is similar to that drawn uh, by recent research on Wales by Chris Taylor and his colleagues, but the long time scale is different from their work. This slide compares the rates of entry to higher education of students from independent and education authority schools. It looks only at high socioeconomic status students because there were very few, there weren't enough sample members from lower social groups in the independent uh, schools. Education authority or schools, the public sector schools, are in purple and the independent schools are in red here. And it shows the rate of entry to three categories of university, as I described them earlier. Old universities, that's predating the 20th century, 19, the universities created in the 1960s, and universities created in the 1990s that were formerly colleges. And it does this at two time points, 1962 and in the 1990s, the average in the 1990s. Now, notice that this controls for school attainment. It's for people with about four higher grade 
passes, which is itself quite a high level of attainment. So we're talking here about students well qualified to enter university. The bars for the old universities fall over time because these universities expanded less than the new universities, but that's not the main feature of this slide. What matters here is the comparison of the two school sectors. For example, to interpret this, look at the right hand uh, uh, panel for, for female students and look at uh, 1962. So in 1962, a female student in this social class with this level of attainment would have a 36% chance of entering an old university if they were from an independent school, but only a 25% chance of entering such a university if they were from a public sector or um, education authority school. So the comparison of the two bars shows the probability of entering a particular category of university for a student of given characteristics in the two different sectors of schooling. So for male and female students, the independent schools had an advantage in 1962 in relation to the old universities. The red bars are bigger than the purple bars. For male students, that was at that date not the case for the other two sectors of university. Three or four decades later, however, in the 1990s, there was an independent school advantage in relation to all these higher education sectors for both female and male students. Now this change, this appearance of an independent school advantage conditioning on controlling for social class sex and attainment cannot be explained by these factors because it's conditional on it. And that conclusion that's that, that, that there is an independent school advantage is similar to that reached by other researchers such as Chris Taylor and colleagues or Vicky Bolivar. In that sense, we can say perhaps that the institutional habitus which linked independent schools to the older universities was extended beyond these universities to all the sectors of the expanding higher education system of the 1990s. That's one part of the story and it's reassuring to see that these data confirm results that have been found by other people such as Bolivar and Taylor. The next two graphs now subdivide the education authority schools according to school origin, the same categories of school origin that I've been looking at at other points in this talk. This slide is still for high socioeconomic status students, so to allow a comparison with the previous slide for independent schools. And it's for old universities only, just to simplify things a bit. The blue bars are for the old schools, that's the schools that predate the 20th century. The orange bar is for all those schools that were founded in the first four decades of the 20th century, so that's combining two of the previous categories. And the grey bars is for all the, forming, all the former junior secondaries. Until the full implementation of comprehensive secondary courses, this slide shows that the old schools had a distinct advantage amongst the high social class students for entry to the old universities. For example, again, look at female students here. For female students in 1962, the chance of such a student with this level of attainment entering an old university was 30% from the oldest schools, 23% from the early 20th century schools, and 8% from the former junior secondaries. And I would emphasize again, that difference cannot be due to different levels of attainment in these schools because this graph controls for attainment. It's got something to do with the particular affinity between particular categories of school defined historically and this status, this a, a category of high status old universities. But then that difference by school on origin vanished. It did not persist into the 1990s, which is the second part, the right hand part of each of these two panels. There's hardly any difference at all remaining for males and none at all for females. There was much less advantage for medium social class and low social class students. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, for low status students, we have it here. There is a bit of an advantage in the 1960s for males, but much less than on the previous graph for high social class students and not much advantage between the two oldest sectors of secondary school for females. What's more, and th these, these, this set of graphs has shown only entry to the old universities, but for no group was there any old school advantage for entry to the other sectors of higher education. So what we might conclude from these graphs is that there was probably some kind of affinity between the old schools and the old universities especially for high social class students before selection for secondary school was ended and before higher education started to expand. There was a weaker 
that's the blue bars here, there was a weaker but still distinct affinity between these universities and the secondaries that had been created early in the 20th century, that's the orange bars. But any affinity of that kind between the oldest universities and these two groups of senior secondary schools was brought to an end by comprehensivization and showed no sign of re-emerging when higher education expanded in the 1990s. This contrasts, remember, with the independent schools, where we saw that there was evidence of at least persisting affinity with the highest status parts of higher education and probably of a strengthening of that affinity. So in conclusion, I think it's reasonable to say not only that institutions matter, but also that the legacies of institutions interact with each other and interact with the intentions of policymakers. That's the first conclusion. The history of schools and universities makes a difference. The second conclusion is that these legacies are not themselves unchanging. We saw that in what appeared to be the growing affinity between independent schools and higher education institutions as higher education expanded. This was an affinity found for high social class students especially, and so it is perhaps a distinctive way in which long established hierarchies of advantage are created afresh in an era of apparent democratization, what Lucas calls effectively maintained inequality. And the key point for today is that this maintenance of advantage is expressed partly through institutional affinity. Nevertheless, policy can have an effect because it can modify what has been called institutional habitus, which is the third conclusion. We saw that in two respects in relation to the old secondary schools. These schools sustained an advantage in attainment right through the period when comprehensive schools were being introduced, but then they were guided by policy into a common system of secondary schooling by means probably of the common curricular framework of the 1980s and 1990s. Over and above attainment, these old schools also seemed to have an affinity to the oldest universities that gradually declined, even while the independent school affinity with these universities increased. The final conclusion is that some institutions can intensify the effects of policy, as we saw with those former junior secondaries, which had long had a tradition of teaching academic subjects, often in conflict with official discouragement. These academic junior secondaries thus might be said to have embodied what Alistair McIntyre called continuities of conflict, showing that a tradition can be a source of change as well as of resistance to change. Of course, to understand how these institutional legacies have an impact on students' minds requires completely different kinds of evidence from the statistical analysis that I've summarized today. There already is some such evidence for independent schools investigating not only how they have what Diane Ray and her colleagues call close friendly networks with particular high status universities, but also further back how these independent schools reinvented themselves as agents of meritocracy when the public sector was ending selection in the 1960s. We need similar archival and ethnographic research on such diverse topics as how the formerly close connection between the old secondaries and the old universities declined after the ending of selection, or on how the junior secondaries that had sustained an academic tradition adapted most effectively to the new comprehensive era. So a lot more needs to be done to investigate whether the merely statistical patterns of institutional distinctiveness really do relate to something that might reasonably be called institutional habitus. But I hope to have shown here today that ethnographic and archival work of these kinds might yield valuable returns for our understanding of the role which educational institutions play in educational change. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lindsay. A fascinating talk there and uh, um, very, very interesting. Um, well, I'll pass on now to our two discussants, uh, Anya. Uh, and Rita, um, who, who'd like to start uh, first? Um, perhaps uh, Anya, do you want to start first? Okay, can, can. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it very much. And I think it's um, what I find especially fascinating, as you already said, Lindsay, is the fact that you are looking at not at this deliberate policies, but also this more covered effect of these policies and, and institutions. And I think that um, doing that in such a systematic and careful way as you did with some, um, yeah, it's really wonderful and very interesting to hear. And it seems that Scotland is really a great case because I've never seen such data in other places. So it's, it's really impressive. And I, I, 
I also second the idea of combining this type of analysis with like ethnographic analysis and archival research. I was thinking of a colleague of mine whom I met in the US and she um, did ethnographic research in Italy in different places and looked at how different classes perceive different types of schooling. Now this is in a um, in upper secondary, so there were different types, actually different types of schooling, academic, non-academic, and so on. But also she it was she found, she saw a lot of very striking differences in, in how different classes in different regions perceived these different types of schools and what they thought that these schools were doing and how they reacted. So their preferences, how they behaved in schools, how they perceived what a successful student is and things like that. So to look at how this interacts, how this not only the school is the type of schooling is defined on paper, but how it's actually perceived in people's mind and in, in employers' mind. I think it that would be very interesting to combine the two um, aspects. Then I have two questions. I think uh, comments questions, and one what what I was thinking about is um, the effect of sorting of like population sorting and student sorting in this reform so we in the project i'm working on now we are looking at comprehensive reforms in different places and in several places in uh, i can think of belgium ireland australia also the way in which the comprehensive schools at the lower secondary um, level were implemented had an effect on how student populations sorted in different schools so parent middle class parents and higher class parents tended to avoid comprehensive schools if they had an option to opt out. They either um, went into the private sector or tried to go into those schools which kept some selective system. So I was thinking, is there an interaction between the, how these reforms and is implemented and how much freedom people have in selecting some schools? Because we know parents and pupils are interested in being perceived as better in going to those schools that are perceived as being better than other schools. So even in a comprehensive system, there are some some elements that are that give some kind of signals to um, parents and um, to employers. So I was I was wondering about this sorting and whether the effects that you find, the differences that you see, whether they could also be due by the kind of population that then chooses this, this different type, these different types of schooling or these different categories of schooling uh, you presented. For instance, I was thinking that the connection you find between the old secondary schools and the universities is it due only to the fact that these schools like operate differently and do things differently, or is it also due to the fact that certain types of populations which have like the networks and the knowledge and the type of culture that goes into this old university continued to go into these schools or even went more into these, opted more into these schools because they thought they were somehow better than, than the other types of schools in a compre formally comprehensive system. And it will, if you think that this could be something that also has an effect and what would be a good way of finding that out would be another question I would be interested in. What, would be a good way to parse out different types of effects and causes. And that leads to my second um, questions or question or comment is about the mechanisms that explain the findings that you or the kind of dynamics and differences between groups that you can show. So you speak of habitus or institutional history. And I was wondering what the specific things that mechanisms that are at work that, that explain this difference, different developments and these are only hypotheses. I think you mentioned different, um, different. You mentioned different, like types of mechanisms that could have an effect. So administrative routines, having a library or not, and having library staffed in a certain way or not, buildings, teacher training. I was thinking of other um, possibility again, signaling in combination with sorting. So this would maybe explain things like why these older schools tended to adopt the reforms later because they thought it would harm them more in terms of which students they attract or not. Another option, another um, or hypothesis I was thinking about is um, curriculum differentiation. So you said that in the 1980s curricula were um, like harmonized or became more similar, but then 
I was wondering whether you still had some kind of specialization maybe across schools or some in Ireland, I know that some schools remained more vocational than others, even if the system was uh, formally comprehensive or whether girls had different curricula in some schools. So again, from my research in Swiss, into Swiss curricula, we found that um, gender differentiation interacts with class. So, so schools that target higher classes generally have less gender differentiation, at least in the secondary schools we looked at. So there might be another, another difference um, between school. And the third uh, hypothesis I was thinking about is um, teachers' attitudes and teachers' backgrounds in this school. So I remember a study I read, the, and these were also sociologists of education, um, they in Italy had a comprehensive reform in the 1960s and sec they put secondary teachers in charge of all children at the lower secondary level before these were like um, gymnasium or grammar school teachers and there was a survey right after the reform and um, they asked these teachers what they thought about their classes and if, if you read it it's quite um, hard so many of them have very strong classes opinions they think their students like the lower class students should not be in their schools they're unable to learn they were previously in the previous system they were supposed to like instruct the elite now they have to instruct the masses so you find this kind of very strong attitudes among teachers and i was thinking on the one hand this could explain why different schools with different traditions act would behave differently and on the other hand it's also would explain certain temporal dynamics because you have these teachers are then substituted with new teachers who find it normal that there are different pupils in a classroom. Yeah, that would be my main comments. Splendid. Thank you very much again. Splendid. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. Very, very interesting comments there. Um, and uh, um, secondly, to Rita. Rita, if I could pass on to Rita Nikolai. Okay. And then we'll start. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for your talk. I learned a lot about the developments in Scotland. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the Scottish situation, so I learned really a lot. And um, the presentation was also very helpful and fruitful for me. It was great to see that the survey you presented here or the data you presented here offer such a broad source of data and also along such a long time period since I would say the Second World War. In Germany, we started just a few years ago with the establishment of a long time series with individual data about educational careers. It's the German National Educational Panel Study, and which provides also longitudinal data on educational processes and competence development. But we started only in the year 2009. So um, this data set is really in uh, the children's shoes and not uh, has not such a long history as um, the survey you presented here. Um, your presentation was also a good example how researchers and even in the history of education can use such quantitative data in analyzing developments of education systems and not only by focusing on documents or qualitative interviews or secondary literature, but also to use data for analyzing and describing um, developments in the education system. And your presentation showed here the potential of such a research which combines quantitative analysis with qualitative perspectives. Mm -hmm. When I understood you right in your presentation, you have showed us um, that how, or how school traditions could constrain changes and that there is an interaction with the institutional history with policy change. And here my comments, or I have to say my three or four questions uh, will start them. I always ask why things are happening and who are the main drivers and who are pow pow powerful drivers also who influence changes in, a, in an education system. Could you explain a little bit more in how far the institutional habitus, and it's a um, little bit goes in the direction also by the comment of Anya, um, could you explain a little bit um, how the institutional habitus influences the educational outcomes you described in your presentation, because here I missed a little bit the link um, to your data. Who are the main sources of such an institutional habitus? 
even when a school turned to a comprehensive school, the teachers changed not in the school because you have like old wine in new bottles here. You have to work with um, the old teachers and they have their ideas about educational equity, about how to um, promote um, different people from different social classes and so on. So but even when you have, uh, even when you change a school into a comprehensive school, this does not mean that you have then comprehensive oriented, oriented teachers in the school. So um, are these, act um, you, perhaps you could say a little bit in how far teachers or also school principals can really change school cultures here for understanding then um, changes in an education system. Then uh, the second question I have concretely on slide 22, where you have explained the percentage of staying in the school after age 16 by the sex and economic status. And I was a little bit surprised that um, for the socioeconomic status of um, the medium line and the low socioeconomic status, there were between the mid of the 1970s and until the end of the 1980s, a few fluctuations here. It was not a stable line here. Uh, I'm not familiar with this situation in Scotland, so uh, I ask myself, what is happening here? Why there are such, fluctua such um, fluctuations here? What are the reasons for these fluctuations? Are there, or could they be explained by socio-political developments, by developments in, in the labor market, or also influences of different educational measures here? What is your explanation for this? And then um, there was also another slide. It was slide uh, 27 or even uh, 28. Um, here, I still don't know if I'm really right in my understanding. Do I understand it correctly that uh, women gained not so much from the comprehensivization, um, what you have described here in your data, as there is not such a reduction in the socioeconomic percentage point gap in the group of the female in comparison to the male ones. Um, this was a little bit surprising for me and perhaps you could explain it a little bit more or if I'm really um, right here. What is your explanation for this development? And this is my last question. What are your future plans now? What are you doing then in the future out with this data on the basis um, of the data you have presented in your um, presentation? Do you think that it is now important to combine your data analysis with a qualitative perspective on what you would like to do here? Uh, like document analysis, analysis of secondary literature or so on. Um, I'm not sure if interviews are really helpful here, but perhaps you could explain a little bit what you are doing then in the future with these data. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was really great.